So, at the end of Season 1, our woodland heroes finally make it to White Deer Park, where after all the struggles and dangers, they can finally kick back, relax, and enjoy a life of peace. Having seen Season 1 air on television growing up as a kid, I kind of assumed that that was the end of the series, as I'd never seen or heard anything air after. So, it was a shock to me to find out that years later, there were, in fact, a Season 2 and a Season 3. But then that posed a question to me as to where the series would go next. After all, they had finally found their place of safety. Would it be similar to the Land Before Time film series, where the first film was very dark in tone, but after finding the Great Valley, the series would then continue on a much more light-hearted note and kid-friendly tone? Would it be the same for the animals of Farving Wood, now that they found the paradise of White Deer Park? No. Though season one seemed to have left the series at a good finishing point, it still left a few burning questions as to what may happen once the animals settled into the park. Would they still hold true to the oath and vow not to harm or eat one another? Would they stay together or go their separate ways? And how would the other animals already in the park react to their arrival? Well, Season 2 does a pretty good job at answering those questions. And this will be a good time to mention that this review will contain spoilers, both for Season 2 and Season 1. So, if you don't want to have major plot points spoiled, or the fates of characters spoiled, click off now and watch the series first. Those of you that are still here, let's look at the overall plot. The animals get a hero's welcome, as news of their journey has spread far across the land, to the point where they've become somewhat of an urban legend. However, we do get a brief cut to see a family of blue foxes who aren't quite as thrilled as everyone else, but we'll get more into them a bit later. So the Farthing Wood animals settle happily into their new environment, but the peace doesn't last long, as Kestrel, who was out hunting one day, preys upon a small field mouse, only to discover it was actually one of the Farthing Wood mice. This begins to bring a lot of debate into whether the oath still holds, and whether it should even remain. After all, the predators need to eat in order to survive, especially as winter will soon be along and pressure to find food will only increase. Fox insists that the oath will remain amongst the farthing wood animals, but will not extend to non farthing wood animals. This doesn't make life much easier though, as the other animals that are non farthing wood pretend to be farthing wood animals in order to deter away the predators. It also means in order to hunt the non-farthing wood animals, they need to venture out onto other territories, and that territory in particular is owned by that of the blue foxes. Now in the book, it's worth noting that these are actually just another family of red foxes, but I imagine to avoid confusion of getting the numerous foxes mixed up in the TV series, they changed them from the classic red to a more distinctive blue. The leader of the blue foxes is Scarface, who isn't too fond to hear about the arrival of the farthing wood animals, especially Fox and Vixen, who he sees as inferior and potential competition. Tensions begin to rise as Scarface begins to attack the other farthing wood animals, eventually leading to an all-out brawl between the blue foxes and the farthing wood animals. That's the main arc for this season, but there are also some subplots thrown into the mix such as Badger injuring his leg and being taken into care by the warden, poachers entering the park to hunt the animals, and one of Fox's sons, Bold, leaving the park in order to find an independent life beyond the park boundaries. These plots are mostly just there for filler purposes and don't really contribute much to the overall arc, which kind of leads me to one of my negatives I found with this season, and that is the pacing. In season one, the pace was pretty consistent, Overall, we're following the animals' journey to the park, with each episode taking place in a different location where the animals would encounter new dangers. Season 2, however, is all taking place in White Deer Park, so there's no journey with various places this time around. Instead, the central plot is the focus between the Farthing Wood animals feuding against the Blue Foxes. It's not as strong as the narrative from the first season, and in order to drag this plotline out, there are lots of filler subplots put in to fill episode time. This would be fine, but the subplots don't offer any real connection to the main arc, which essentially makes them useless. 
and only builds to frustration when they get in the way of the main story. Where instead of following Scarface's ploy to kill the farthing wood animals, we get an episode dedicated to Bold and his adventures outside of the park. Which is not awful by any means, but it just feels like a huge detour from the more intense and story driven events happening elsewhere. And I could forgive this if any of the subplots actually played a role in the final showdown. So let's say we see Bold's character development, the friends he makes, and how they come together to help with the final showdown at the end. Or how the poachers attack in the park would have more of an impact by killing or wounding a key character, like the White Stag for example, which could benefit Scarface's chances for total control. Simple links like this that could give filler material more meaning, better narrative and stronger character development. And speaking of character development, let's talk about some of the characters. Unlike the first season where the episode's focus was more on the environment the animals were in, rather than the animals themselves, season 2 all takes place in the same location, so more attention gets focused on the characters and gives them a chance to be more fleshed out. One surprising character for this is Owl, who in season 1 wasn't given that much depth, but in season 2 we see a bit more of her emotional and vulnerable side, particularly when she wrongly thinks that she was responsible for Fox getting killed by a poacher. And I was so upset about, you know, you and Whistler not telling me the air raids had been stopped. And I thought they'd shot Fox and it was all my fault. <laughs> oh, Al, please forgive me. Everything's all right now. We also get a bunch of new characters added to the show, some I like and others I didn't. The two biggest new characters are our main villains for the series, and that's Scarface and his mate. As far as villains go, they're okay. Scarface is pretty much your generic bad guy. He shows instant dislike to the farthing wood animals. He'll intimidate and kill them with no remorse, and will even show abuse to his own family. But aside from that, there's not really much else to say about him. He's just a one-dimensional, unfleshed out prick. Which is fine, as he serves the purpose for the narrative, but I like my villains to have a little more depth, some backstory, and conflicting emotions that can sometimes help you understand where they're coming from. Like where did he even get his scar? Is that part of the reason that he's such a hostile person? As for his mate, she's also a pretty generic villain character too, though they do try to add a bit of depth to her through the abuse she suffers from Scarface, and it sometimes makes you wonder is she actually an all out evil person, or is part of that down to the intimidation and suffering she has faced from her partner? The next major new character in season 2 is Fox's son, Bold. Bold is… okay. His arc is that he doesn't like being under his father's rule, and so goes out to live his own life beyond the park. We see the new friends he makes, and the new mate he finds for himself. I was actually quite liking his character, until he essentially turned into a whiny bitch at the end where even on the brink of death he refused to eat and drink because out of sheer principle he didn't want to re-enter White Deer Park. It just seemed a bit of a pathetic ending for what was meant to be a strong character. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it would have been better if his character did return to White Deer Park and using the knowledge and friends he had gained in the outside world, used that to help in the final battle against Scarface, giving his arc a connection to the overall narrative and helping his death feel as though his character had come full circle. Then there were new characters added that I really didn't like. The two characters that irritated me the most were Speedy and Measley. We'll start off with Speedy. First up, she does nothing to serve the plot of the show. If she was removed from the season, none of the events taking place would change at all. Her whole character is just there to be really annoying, she has a high-pitched, fast-paced voice which just goes on and on, it is more difficult when the pond is frozen over, but on the other hand, fish do tend to be rather sluggish when it's cold, which makes our job easier. So you see, with a little perseverance, we can be as successful in winter as in summer. I guess it's supposed to be there for comedy purposes, but they just don't make her likeable. She comes across as arrogant, bossy, and just plain ignorant. Exciting, dear. Gag her! And then there's <sighs> Measley, who is a male weasel that falls in love with Weasel. 
although with that creepy and demented face, I would argue that he may have far more darker intentions. <laughs> Again, like Speedy, his character doesn't do much to serve the overall plot at all, and is just put in for comedy relief. And also like with Speedy, they just give him the most annoying voice possible. Oh, you're gorgeous. The worst part is that so much screen time in Season 2 is dedicated to Measley and Weasel, and when they're on screen together, it just makes for some uncomfortable and cringeworthy attempts at comedy. The worst part is that with these comedic scenes with Weasel and Measley are normally thrown in during moments of intense build-up, and it just completely kills the pacing of an episode. Hey, Scarface is preparing to attack and wipe out all the Farthingwood animals. We better throw in a five minute scene of Measley and Weasel squabbling for a place to hide. Hey, Weasel and Measley are rushing towards the White Stag to warn of Scarface. Better have a few minutes of them dedicated to squabbling. Weasel and Measley need to deliver an important message to Ada. Better have them get confused and start squabbling again. Ha ha ha, won't it be funny? It is by far the worst part of this season. Please, please someone tell me that he gets killed off in season 3. And now for the character that wasn't just pointless, but was infuriatingly pointless. And this is the character of... Mole's son. Now don't get me wrong, as a character he's not annoying like Speedy or Measley. But it's the way the show uses his character that really infuriated me. So back in season 1, one of the friendships which was developed the most was between Badger and Mole. Arguably, it was probably the closest friendship in the show. And that is still carried over into the beginning of Season 2, where Mole is distraught to find Badger is missing, and then is the most overjoyed to see him return. That's fine, that's good. But later in the season, Mole meets a female Mole and is just like, peace out, and just scurries off without saying a word. No goodbye, no remorse, just gone. We then get told later by Mole's new partner, that Mole actually died off screen due to the coldness of winter. And I'll say that again, one of the bigger characters in season one just randomly dies off screen and due to the cold, which for a Mole who is living underground with a partner to cuddle up with is probably one of the warmest places to be it is utterly ridiculous to say that his death was caused by a little cold. But here is where it really begins to take the mick. During winter, Mole actually had a son, who happens to look just like him. So much so that Badger can't tell the difference, and no one bothers to correct Badger on this, so Badger goes on believing that this new Mole is actually his old friend Mole. And the show even uses recycled animation from season 1 of Badger and Mole and puts them into segments where it's now Badger and Mole's son. So what was the point in having Mole killed off in the first place? There was no logical reason to kill off one of the bigger characters of the show and give it zero emotional impact. This is made worse when later in the season Badger ends up dying and they have Mole's son grieving over the loss. Don't you think this scene could have been far more impactful and powerful if it was Mole grieving over his best friend's death? I mean, I wasn't the biggest fan of Mole's character from season 1, but you literally had two of the best friends in the show die in the same season and not one of them realised the other was dead. That, in my opinion, is poor writing and a huge waste of potential for an emotional scene in the show. Okay, final thoughts. I realise in this review I did come across far more critical for the season than I did in Season 1. And that's not because I think Season 2 is bad, I just think compared to Season 1, Season 1 had a lot more going for it. But I will say that in despite of my criticisms, Season 2 is still a very enjoyable watch. I was relieved to see that the show maintained its mature approach and doesn't sugar gloss over the death and violence, which is what made the first season so respectable in the first place. The animation and the art style remains consistent, though they're still guilty of reusing the same animation over and over. The music still holds its classical orchestra, again borrowing from the music used in Season 1, but still throwing in a new score here and there. I like how they addressed and tackled the questions left at the end of Season 1, such as how the Farthingwood Predators would cope with the Oath, and whether the animals would bother sticking together. 
It does also give us a chance to further explore characters which weren't quite as fleshed out in Season 1. But at the same time, I wish they could have done it better. Do a better job focusing on the characters we knew from Season 1, rather than wasting screen time on all these newly, seemingly forced to introduce characters into Season 2. And that's the Animals of Farthingwood Season 2. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video and let me know how you found Season 2, particularly its comparison to Season 1. Join me next time where we'll be looking at the third and final season of the show. Until then though, take care.